Welcome to part three of our reading of the Book of Jubilees. Today we're going to be covering chapters 7 through 10. Once again, this is a Cliff Notes version of everything that was covered on the Dark Outpost yesterday. If you would like a deeper discussion regarding these missing or banned books from the Bible, then please make sure to join us on the Dark Outpost on Tuesdays. There is a link down in the description box below. And as always, I would love to give a very special thank you to all of our patrons on this page. Without your support, this channel would not be possible, and I greatly appreciate each and every one of you. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is also a link down in the description box below. Now again, this is just a reading. I will be giving some commentary, but as I said earlier, if you want more of a discussion, then do make sure to join us on The Dark Outpost on Tuesdays. I believe our episode on The Dark Outpost is now live, so if you catch our episode live, you will be able to call into the show and ask questions while David and I are discussing the section of Jubilees that we are discussing for the week. And as always, I want to remind everybody to please be respectful to each other in the comments section below. I know that discussing religious text can be touchy for people, but what we're doing on this channel and on the Dark Outpost is simply just an exploration of these books that have been deemed heretical by the canonized church. Now again, the Book of Jubilees is recognized by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but not in any other churches. It is up to you and your own personal faith whether you believe this book is heretical or not. But regardless of what anybody else feels about this book, I really ask that you guys be respectful to each other in the comments section. All right, let's get started with chapter seven. Chapter seven of the Book of Jubilees is called Noah offers sacrifice, the cursing of Canaan, Noah's sons and grandsons and their cities, Noah's abomination. And some of the stuff we're going to see in chapter 7 is stuff that we have talked about in the past when it came to exploring the history of the Canaanites. Um, and so I'll give a brief refresher as we start to go through some of these stories. But if you happen to miss that episode, it is on the Dark Outpost library. Um, I don't have it on my channel. It was strictly something we did for the Dark Outpost. So once again, please follow the link down below to find that episode if you want a deeper dive into the history of the curse of Canaan and how the Canaanites that we know today came to be. And in the seventh week, in the first year thereof, in this jubilee, Noah planted vines on the mountain on which the ark had rested, named Labar, one of the Arat mountains. And they produced fruits in the fourth year, and he guarded their fruits and gathered it in this year in the seventh month. And he made wine therefrom and put it into a vessel and kept it until the fifth year, until the first day on the new moon of the first month. And he celebrated with joy the day of the feast, and he made a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord, one young ox, one ram, seven sheep, each a year old, and a kid of a goat, that he might make atonement thereby for himself and his sons. Now, if you followed along with us when we read the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, we know that Jesus was very upset about these animal sacrifices, and he basically said, this has to stop. In fact, when he went into the temple and saw all the bankers there, we know the story from the canonized Bible where he was very upset about the merchants doing business in the temple, but what the canonized Bible leaves out or what was taken out of the canonized Bible, because yes, we know for a fact that the canonized Bible we have was heavily altered and edited at the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century. Fact checkers and censorship has been around for a very, very long time. And in my opinion, that's what makes these missing gospels so interesting, is that we see a lot of the circumstances that had been omitted from the canonized Bible, and it makes you wonder why. Why they took certain practices, certain storylines out of the canonized Bible. And again, one of those storylines was Jesus being very upset about the sacrificing of innocent animals in the temples. In the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, Jesus 
almost in every single chapter talks about how our responsibility as human beings is to take care of the animals as if they were our brothers and sisters. One of my favorite lines from the Gospel of the Holy Twelve was when Jesus says, does not the animal breathe the same air that you breathe? We also saw last week about the idea of not eating blood, eating anything that has blood in it. That blood is very holy. It carries your genetic makeup. We know that the um, Canaanites today still partake in the celebratory um, drinking of certain blood. And when I'm reading this book of Jubilee and I'm reading about all these animal sacrifices, it does hurt my heart. Um, not something I enjoy reading at all, um, but it is what it is. So we'll go on to verse 4. And he prepared the kid first. So again, not a child, not a human child, but a goat, the younger of goat. And placed some of its blood on the flesh that was on the altar which he had made. And all the fat he laid on the altar where he had the burnt sacrifice. And the ox and the ram and the sheep. And he laid all their flesh upon the altar. And he placed all their offerings mingled with oil upon it, and afterwards he sprinkled wine on the fire which he had previously made on the altar, and he placed incense on the altar and caused a sweet savor to ascend acceptable before the Lord his God. And he rejoiced and drank of this wine, he and his children with joy. And it was evening, and he went into his tent, and being drunken, he lay down and slept, and he was uncovered in his tent as he slept. So Noah partied a little too hard and basically passed out. <clears throat> Verse 8, And Ham saw Noah his father naked, and went forth, and told his brethren without. And Sham took his garment and arose, and he had Jepheth, and they placed the garment on their shoulders and went backwards and covered the shame of their father, and their faces were backwards. And when Noah woke from his sleep and knew that his younger son had done unto him, he cursed his son, saying, Cursed be Canaan, an enslaved servant shall he be unto his brethren. So Canaan is the son of Ham. Technically, he is the grandson of Noah. Now, there is theories that we spoke about when we covered the Canaanites that when we're looking at these, these terminologies using like, like um, cursed by Noah because of nakedness or uncovered his nakedness, this is a fancy way to speak of the way people procreate human beings. I have to be careful about what I say on YouTube. And the implication here, a lot of people will read this and think that Noah was mad at him because... Ham saw his father naked. Well, that's ridiculous. Why would a father, especially a righteous father like Noah, curse his son just for accidentally wondering in on his father who was passed out drunk and seeing him naked? What we're looking at, what the theory is, is that Ham actually had a relationship, an inappropriate relationship with his mother, Noah's wife, which produced Canaan. Noah's grandson and Ham's son and Ham's mother's son. We know that the Canaanites still today practice this form of uncleanliness. I, there's a word for it, but I can't, I don't know if I can say that word on YouTube. You guys, it starts with an I. You guys know what I'm talking about. And so that is why Canaan was cursed as an abomination. And this is now where we get the new set of Canaanites. The original Canaanites were from Adam's son, Cain, but obviously they were all wiped out with the flood. So now we have a new set of Canaanites. So we'll go back to verse 11. And he blessed Shem and said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Depeth, and God shall dwell in the dwellings of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Ham knew that his father had cursed his younger son, and he was displeased that he had cursed his son, and he parted from his father, he and his sons with them, Cush, Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. And he built for himself a city and called its name after the name of his wife, Ne'elet Amen Uk. And once again, forgive me if I mispronounce these names. Verse 15. And Jepheth saw it and became envy of his brother, and he too built for himself a city, and he called its name after the name of his wife, 
Adat and As Yeses. And Shem dwelt with his father Noah, and he built a city close to his father on the mountain. And he too called its name after the name of his wife, Sedek It El Ibab. And behold, there were three cities near Mount Labar. Sedet Ek El Ibab, fronting the mountain on its east, and Ne'elet at Emuk on the south, and Adat and Yesus towards the west. And there are the sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arpak, Shiad, and this son was born two years after the flood, and Lud in Aram. And the sons of Jepheth, Gomor and Magog, and Madadi, and Javan, Tubal, and Meshetit, and Tyrus, and these are the sons of Noah. And in the 28th Jubilee, Noah began to enjoin upon his sons, sons, the ordinance and the commandments and all the judgments that he knew. And he exhorted his sons to observe righteousness and to cover the shame of their flesh and to bless their creator and honor father and mother and love their neighbor and guard their souls from fornication and uncleanliness in all iniquity. For owing to these three things came the flood upon the earth, namely owing to the fornication, wherein the watchers against the law of their ordinance went to whoring after the daughters of men and took themselves wives of all which they chose, and they made the beginning of uncleanliness. And they begat the sons of the Nephiadim, like the Nephilim, but a little bit different pronunciation, and they were all unlike, and they devoured one another. And the giants slew the Nephilim, and the Nephilim slew Eloja and Eloja, the mankind, and one man and the other. And everyone sold himself to work inequity and to shed much blood in the earth filled with inequity. And after they sinned against the beast and the birds and all that moveth and walketh on the earth, and much blood was shed on the earth and every imagination and desire of man imagine vanity and evil continually so basically noah is now sitting with his grandsons and if you can remember now human beings lived a very long time and so this was their duty to now repopulate the earth and so noah is warning his grandsons who were not around for the flood about what happened with the Nephilim about the idea that these um, fallen angels had reproduced with women and the world became wicked. And so he's warning his grandsons. And we know from Jesus, when Jesus was asked about the last days, he said it would be like the days of Noah. So like what was happening before the flood happened. And we're kind of seeing that now on our earth as well. We also see from our schooling system that this story was completely scrubbed from our history books. It's also, there are references in the Bible, like there's some references in Genesis to the giants. There's some references in Numbers. We know about David and Goliath. We know that there are references to the Nephilim, to the giants. However, the churches have done a really good job of just kind of ignoring it. Um, and I don't think that that is done by accident. I think there's some intention behind that. Knowledge is power. And so this warning that Noah is giving his grandson, that that is for a reason. And now we're just now rediscovering what happened in the beginning of this timeline before the flood. So we move on to verse 25. And the Lord destroyed everything from off the face of the earth because of the wickedness of their deeds and because of the blood which they had shed in the midst of the earth, he destroyed everything. And we were left, I and you, my sons, and everything that entered us into the ark. And behold, I see your works before me that ye do not walk in righteousness. This is Noah speaking. For in the path of destruction, ye have begun to walk and you are parting from one another and are envious of one another. And so it cometh that ye are not in harmony, my sons, each with his brother. Again, he's giving them a warning. For I see and behold, the demons have begun their seductions against you and against your children. And now I fear on your behalf that after my death, ye will shed the blood of men upon the earth and that ye too will be destroyed from the face of the earth. For those who so sheddeth man's blood and who so eateth the blood of any flesh will be destroyed from all the earth. And there will not be left any man that eateth blood 
or that sheddeth the blood of man on the earth, nor will there be left to him any seed or descendants living under the heavens, for into Sheol they will go. Now Sheol, spelled S-H-E-O-L, is a word that means Hades. In the year 200 BC, when a lot of the Gospels were, or the Old Testament, not the Gospels yet, but the Old Testament, were translated from Hebrew to Greek, they changed the word Sheol to Hades. So now you know what that place is. Basically, all these people that are doing this wickedness, like eating blood, you know, killing each other, that they're going to basically go to hell, is basically what um, Noah is warning his grandsons. And into the place of condemnation they will descend, and into the darkness of the deep they all will be removed by a violent death. There shall be no blood seen upon you, for all the blood there shall be all these days in which ye have killed any beast or cattle, or whatever fleeth upon the earth. And work ye a good work to your souls by covering that which hath been shed on the face of the earth. And ye shall not be like him who eateth the blood, but guard yourselves that none may eat blood before you. Cover the blood, for thus I have been commanded to testify to you and your children together with all flesh." And suffer not the soul to be eaten with flesh, that your blood, which is your life, may not be required at the hand of any flesh that sheddeth it on earth. For the earth will not be clean from blood which hath shed upon it. For only through the blood of him that it shed will the earth be purified throughout all its generations. And now, my children, hearken. Work in righteousness that ye may be planted in righteousness over the face of the whole earth, and glory lifted up before my God who saved me from the waters of the flood. And behold, ye will go and build for yourselves cities, and plant in them all the plants that are upon the earth, and moreover all fruit-bearing trees. For three years of fruit of everything that is eaten will not be gathered, and in the fourth year its fruit will be accounted holy. And they will offer the first fruits accepted before the Most High God, who created earth and heaven and all things. Let them offer in abundance the first of the wine and oils as the first fruits on the altar of the Lord, who receiveth it. And what is left, let the servants of the house of the Lord eat before the altar which receiveth it. And in the fifth year, make ye the release so that ye release it in righteousness and uprightness. Ye shall be righteous, and all that you plant will prosper. For thus did Enoch, the father of your father, commanded Methuselah, his son, and Methuselah, his son, Lamech. And Lamech commanded me of all things which his fathers commanded him. And I also will give you commandment, my son, as Enoch commanded his sons in the first jubilee. Whilst living the seventh in his generation, he commanded and testified to his sons, to his son's sons until the day of his death. And that concludes chapter 7. We will now move on to chapter 8. So chapter 8 is the genealogy of the descendants of Shem. Noah and his sons divide the earth. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 are going to carry on the same conversation about the earth being divided amongst Noah's three sons. I find this very, very fascinating. Some people might find this boring, but this is really interesting to me about how the earth was divided amongst his sons. And we see now the different areas have different looking people as far as skin color, hair color, eye color. And it's not like they're dividing the land like you have one continent that has the same race of people divided between two of the sons, we're going to see all three of the sons in different areas. It's, it's, it's all just very, very fascinating to me. This is also where we get the book of divisions from, where people call the book of Jubilees the book of divisions. And hopefully after reading through this, you will see why. Once again, we are going to get into some names that I may or may not be pronouncing correctly, so I apologize if they are pronounced incorrectly. I am doing the best I can with these very foreign and very ancient names. All right, so chapter 8. In the 29th Jubilee, in the first week, 
In the beginning thereof, Arpachshad took himself a wife, and her name was Rashuija, the daughter of Susan, the daughter of Alam, and she bare him a son in the third year in this week, and she called his name Canaan. And the son grew, and his father taught him writing, and he went to seek for himself a place where he might seize for himself a city. So this character of Canaan is interesting. He obviously has an education. His father taught him how to write, and if you teach somebody how to write, then you're obviously teaching them how to read as well. And we know that if you know how to write and read, then you can really learn anything. Reading and writing is the basis of all education. Verse 3, he found a writing which a former generation had carved on a rock, and he read what was thereon, and he transcribed it, and sinned owing to it, for it contained the teachings of the watchers, in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and the moon and the stars and all the signs of the heaven. And he wrote it down and said nothing regarding it, for he was afraid to speak to Noah about it, lest he should be angry with him on account of it. So we have this kid, our young man, whose father taught him how to read and write, who obviously is a descendant of Noah, some generations down, which is another fascinating aspect that we're seeing multiple generations in our lifetimes now. We're lucky if we get to meet our great grandparents before they pass away. We never get to meet our ancestors that are multiple generations removed from us. But in this time, people did know Noah lived what, a little over 900 years. And so his, his descendants knew who he was. And this kid, this descendant of Noah, found some old writings that, that were from the watchers. When the watchers taught people how to use plant medicine, how to read the stars, all these things before the contamination happened. And so this kid is writing down everything that he read from the watchers, but he's hiding it. He's not telling anybody he has it because he's afraid to show Noah because of the horror stories that they've heard regarding the watchers before the great flood, which is before their time. Moving on to the fifth verse in the 13th Jubilee in the second week in the first year thereof, he took himself a wife and her name was Maleka, the daughter of Madai and the son of Japheth. And in the fourth year, he beget a son and called his name Shalom. For he said, truly, I have been sent. And in the fourth year, he was born and Shalom grew up and took to himself a wife. And her name was Muak, the daughter of Kesed, his father's brother in the, in the one and thirtieth Jubilee, in the fifth week, in the first year thereof. And she bare him a son in the fifth year thereof, and called his name Eber. And he took unto himself a wife, and her name was Azurad, the daughter of Nebrod. And in the thirty-second jubilee, in the seventh week, in the third year thereof. And in the sixth year thereof, she bare him a son, and he called his name Peleg. For in the days when he was born, the children of Noah began to divide the earth amongst themselves. For this reason he called his name Peleg. And they divided it secretly amongst themselves and told it to Noah. And it came to pass in the beginning that the 33rd Jubilee, that they divided the earth into three parts. For Shem and Ham and Japheth, according to their inheritance of each, in the first year, in the first week, when one of us who had been sent was with them. And he called his sons, and they drew nigh to him, they and their children, and he divided the earth into lots which his three sons were to take in possession. And they reached forth their hands and took the writings out of the bosom of Noah their father. And there came forth on the writings as Shem's lot, the middle of the earth, which he would take as an inheritance for himself and for the sons of the generations of eternity from the middle of the mountain range of Rapha, from the mouth of the water from the river Tina, and his portion goeth towards the west through the midst of the river, and it extended till it reacheth the water of the abysses 
out of which this river goeth forth and poureth and its waters into the sea Miet, and the river floweth from the great sea and all that is towards the north is Japheth's and all that is toward the south belongs to Shem. So I have some notes here that Shem actually, so it was prophesied that Shem would inherit the best land. And we're going to see why this land is the best later on. But so Shem's people, his generations, his descendants, inherited the Middle East, India, and China. We're also going to see as we dive deeper into this that the Garden of Eden is an actual place that was still marked as a location in this time. People knew where it was. It would be like, oh, today, okay, so, you know, if you're in New York, you know, it's just down from the Empire State Building. Or if you're here in Atlanta, it's just down from, you know, this particular park is just down the street from the World of Coca-Cola Museum. This is a landmark, the Garden of Eden. And they knew where this landmark was. It was how they measured how close things were, which is really interesting. And one of the commentators that I listened to brought up a good point, and I happen to agree with him, that I am betting that the powers that be in our world still know where the Garden of Eden is. I would love to hear your opinions about that in the comment section below. So verse 13, and it extended till it reaches Caracaso and the bosom tongue which it looketh towards the south. And his portion extended along the great sea, and it extendeth into the straight line till it reached the west of the tongue, which looketh towards the south, for this sea is named the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And it turneth from here towards the south, towards the mouth of the great sea on the shore of its waters, and it extended to the west to Afra, and it extended till it reached the waters of the river Gihon, and the south of the waters of Gihon to the banks of the river. And it extended towards the east till it reached the Garden of Eden, to the south thereof, to the south and from the east of the whole land of Eden. And to the whole cast it turneth to the east, and proceedeth till it reach the east of the mountain named Rapha, and it descendeth to the bank of the mouth of the river Tina. This portion came forth by lot for Shem and his sons, that they should possess it forever until his generation forevermore. And Noah rejoiced that this portion came forth for Shem and for his sons, and he remembered all that he had spoken with his mouth in prophecy, for he had said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and may the Lord dwell in the dwellings of Shem. Again, prophecy that Shem would have the best land, and once more, soon we're going to learn why the Middle East, India, China are considered the best lands. And he knew that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies, and the dwelling of the Lord, and Mount Sinai, the center of the desert, and Mount Zion, the center of the navel of the earth. These threes were created as holy places facing each other. And he blessed the God of God to put the word of the Lord into his mouth, and the Lord forevermore. And he knew that a blessed portion and blessed had come to Shem and his sons unto his generations forever. The whole land of Eden and the whole land of the Red Sea and the whole land of the East and India and on the Red Sea and mountains thereof and the land of Basham and the land of Lebanon and the islands of Katur and all the mountains of Sinir and Amana, and the mountains of Ashur in the north, and all the land of Alam Ashur, and Babel, and Susan, and Miadia, and the mountains of Ararat, and all the region beyond the sea, which is beyond the mountains of Ashur towards the north, and blessed and spacious land, and all that is in it is very good. So it's interesting he, in here, we're talking about how the whole land of Eden and the whole land of the Red Sea which is east of India, and, and we're talking about this, basically this area in the Middle East, Lebanon, you know, that, they, that these places all, these holy places all kind of face each other. And if we look at the Middle East today or through a lot of our modern history, there's always been a lot of issue in the Middle East. It's not like we can really get on a plane and go visit a lots of places in the Middle East because it's so cut off. And there's such a political presence there. And I know for me, I know the people of the of the Middle East are all, for the most part, probably really good people. 
we're looking at government manipulation. So once again, the question that I have and the one of the commentators I listened to also had is, is the Garden of Eden located in this area? And is this why we have such limited access to the Middle East? Just something to ponder. So we're going to go on to verse 22. And for Ham came forth the second portion beyond Gihon and towards the south and to the right of the garden. And it extended toward the south and it extended to all the mountains of fire. And it extended towards the west to the Sea of Atal and extended toward the west till it reached the Sea of Mauk. And the sea unto which everything is not destroyed descendeth. So Ham's people are going to get Africa, okay? Which is interesting because we know Carthage was on the um, coast, the Mediterranean coast of Africa, where there was a lot of Canaanite influence. Um, so that's just interesting. Verse 23, And it goeth forth towards the north limits of Gadir, and it goeth forth toward the coast of the waters to the sea to the waters of the great sea, till it draweth near the river of Gihon, and goeth along the river of Gihon till it reaches the right of the Garden of Eden. And this is the land which came forth for Ham as the portion which he was to occupy forever for himself and his sons unto their generations forever. And for Japheth came forth the third portion of beyond the river, Tina, to the north of the overflow of its waters, and it extended north easternly to the whole region of Gog into all the country east thereof. So I'll give you one guess where Japheth descendants inherited, and that would be obviously Europe. So if you're like me, if you're white, you got European in you, you're from Japheth's line of people. Verse 26, and it extended northerly to the north and extended to the mountain of Quelt towards the north and towards the sea of Mauk, and it goeth forth to the east of Gadir as far as the region of the waters of the sea. And it extendeth until it approacheth the west of Farar, and it returneth towards Afragag, and extendeth easterly to the waters of the sea of Miet. And it extended to the region of the river Tina in the northeasternly direction until it approached the boundary of its waters towards the mountains of Rapha, and it turneth towards the north. This is the land which come forth for Japheth and his sons as the portion of his inheritance, which he should possess for himself and his sons for their generation forever. Five great islands and a great land in the north, but it is cold, and the land of Ham is hot. And the land of Shem is neither hot nor cold, but is of blended cold and heat. So this is why Shem has the best land. The east of Middle East, India, and China has both hot and cold weather. And we know that through the seasons, there are benefits to both the winter and the summer. But in the north, in Europe, it's mostly cold. And in Africa, it's mostly hot. And if you think about the biological makeup of like myself, I'm very much um, a European a person of European descent. I'm an American, but genetically I'm European as a white person and I have blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm definitely made genetically to live in cold, colder environments, even though I live in a very hot part of the United States and I prefer the hot weather and don't really know how to handle snow because I've never lived in a place where it continuously snowed, but my biological body is made for Europe, for Northern Europe. That's where my ancestors came from. My ancestors came from Scandinavia and England and Ger Northern Germany for the most part. I have a little bit of Lebanese in me as well and Egyptian in me as well, but for the most part, that's where they came from, and thus that's what my DNA represents. You look at someone who is black or of African descent, they have more melanin in their skin, they can handle the heat better than someone like me who could get sunburned. And then you look at people from the East. And I remember watching a documentary once where people from the East typically were healthier because they had better diets. Is that because the land and the temperature of land is able to produce more prosperous produce? 
I don't know. But it's interesting in the book of Jubilee, we see the prophecy that the inheritance of Shem was going to be the best land. And here in verse 30, it says, but it is cold, cold in Europe and in the land of Hannah is hot and the land of Shem is neither hot nor cold, but blended the best of both. And that concludes chapter eight. So we're going to go on to chapter nine, which again is just a continuation of chapter eight. This is the subdivision of the three portions amongst the grandchildren, oath taken by Noah's son. And Ham divided amongst his sons, and the first portion came forth for Cush towards the east, and the west of him for Mizraim, and to the west of him for Put, and to the west of him and the west thereof of the sea for Canaan. So Canaan, again, is kind of that Carthage area all up and around the Atlantic coast of Africa. And Sherry also divided amongst his sons. The first portion came forth for Elam and his sons, the east of the river Tigris, till it approached the east, the land of India, and on the Red Sea on its coast, the waters of Dedan, and the mountains of Mebri and Elah, and the lands of Suzan, and all that is on the side of Farnak, to the Red Sea and the river Tina. And for Ashur came forth the second portion, all the land of Ashur and Nivea and Sinar and the border of India and skirteth the river. And for Arpashad came the third portion, all the land of the reign of Chaldees to the east of the Euphrates, bordering on the Red Sea and all the water of the desert close to the tongue of the sea, which look towards Egypt, all the land of Lebanon and Sinar and Amana and the border of the Euphrates. And for Aram, there came forth the fourth Persian, all the land of the Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates to the north of the Chaldees to the borders of the mountains of Ashur and the land of Arar. And to the land forth for Lud, the fifth portion, the mountains of Ashur and all appertaining to them till it reached the great sea until it reaches the east of Ashur, his brother. And Japheth also divided the land of his inheritance amongst his sons. The first portion came forth for Gomer to the east from the north side of the river Tina, and to the north here came forth for Magog, all the inner portions of the north, until it reached the Sea of Miet. And for Madia came forth his portion, that he should possess from the west of his two brothers to the islands, and to the coast of the islands. And for Javan came forth the fourth portion, every island, and the islands which are towards the border of Lud. And for Tubal came forth the fifth portion in the midst of the tongue which approached towards the borders of the portion of Lud to the second tongue to the region beyond the second tongue unto the third tongue. And for Masech came forth the sixth portion all the region beyond the third tongue till it approached the east of Gadir. And for Tyrus there came the fourth and seventh portion, four great islands in the midst of the sea, which reached the portion of Ham, and the islands of Camarturi came out of by lot for the sons of Arpashad on his inheritance. And the sons of Noah divided un unto their sons in the presence of Noah their father, and he bound them all by an oath, imprecating a curse on every one that sought to seize the portion which had not fallen to him by his lot. And they all said, So be it, so be it, for themselves and their sons, forever throughout their generations till the day of judgment, on which the Lord God shall judge them with the sword and fire, and for all the unclean wickedness of their error, wherewith they had fallen the earth with their transgressions and uncleanliness, fornication, and sin. And that concludes chapter 9, and we will now move on to chapter 10. So now we move into chapter 10 of the book of Jubilees. This is titled, Noah's Sons Led Astray by Evil Spirits, Noah's Prayer, Mastima, Death of Noah. And in the third week of this Jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah and to make air and destroy them. So we know from the story of the Nephilim that when the Nephilim were taken out, the souls of the Nephilim became these demons, or what we know as demons. Demons are not fallen angels. Fallen angels technically, I guess, would be the fathers of the demons since the fallen angels were the beings that mated with the women. 
So that is what Noah's son's son, so the children of Noah's sons, his descendants, are dealing with. These demons are now trying to seduce the descendants of Noah to lead them astray, just as they had done in their physical bodies when they were Nephilim on, on the earth. So verse 2, And the sons of Noah came to Noah their father, and they told him concerning the demons which were leading astray and blinding and slaying his sons' sons. And he prayed before the Lord his God and said, God of the spirits of all flesh. God of the spirits of all flesh. So this is interesting because this kind of goes back to the Sethian theology where, again, the Sethian theology in that philosophy, it is believed that Yeldabaoth or Satan actually created our natural bodies. He tried to create human beings to worship him, but he could not give them, they were not animated. Adam kind of sat in the Garden of Eden like a clump of clay because he had no spirit or no consciousness because Yeldabaoth couldn't create that. And so in the Sethian theology, which again would have been known by Jesus and the early Christians, God stepped in and intervened, basically hijacked everything from Yeldabaoth in order to give us life. That's how much God is compassionate and loves us, is that he stepped in, and that's how we have this spirit or this soul. So it's interesting that Noah is saying God of the spirits of all flesh, so even the animals as well. Who has shown mercy unto me and has saved me and my sons from waters of the flood? Hast not caused me to perish as thou didst the sons of perdition? For thy grace hath been great towards me, and great hath thy mercy to my soul. Let thy grace be lifted up upon my sons, and let not wicked spirits rule over them, lest they should destroy them from the earth. But do thou bless me and my sons, that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And thou knowest how thy watchers, the fathers of these spirits, so yes, as I was just saying, the fallen angels, the watchers, are the fathers of these spirits, because these were the spirits that were inside the Nephilim, or the giants that are now the demons. And thou knowest how thy watchers, the fathers of these spirits, acted in my day, and as for these spirits which are living, imprison them and hold them fast in a place of condemnation. And let them not bring destruction on my sons of thy servant, my God. For these are malignant and created in order to destroy. And let them not rule over the spirits of the living. For thou alone canst exercise dominion over them. And let them not have power over the sons of righteousness from henceforth and forevermore. And the Lord God bade us to bind all. And the chief of the spirits, Mastima, so Mastima is Satan. It means adversary, the great adversary. So this is another word for Satan, the devil, Yeldabaoth. So he's come out now and he's going to bargain with God. He said, Lord, creator, let some of them remain before me and let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and leading astray before judgment, for great is the wickedness of some of these men. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him, and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. So God strikes this deal with Satan, with Mastima, and says, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to let you keep a tenth of these demons on the earth to do thy will. But nine tenths of them, 90% of them, are going to be held in bondage. And they're going to be held in bondage until the last of the days. This is spoken about in Revelation. And if you joined us on the Dark Outpost last night, we did go over that part of Revelation. Um, if, if you haven't joined us on the Dark Outpost and you want to um, listen to that conversation, then please follow the link in the description box below. There is a back catalog of all of our past videos. So a lot of Christians do have a problem with this, like why would God leave some demons? But there is, God has a plan even for Satan, and that's that's 
hard for people to accept. I don't personally, and well, I, I think I kind of understand it, but not really because none of us are really ever going to be able to understand God because God is not human. Um, but it might also be because it gives us a chance, a path to take, a free will, for which, which, which of these um, quote unquote gods, God with a capital G and God with a lowercase g, are we going to serve? Okay, so it gives us that that ability to freely choose to serve the God of light, our God. Verse 9, and he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. And one of us, he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines, for he knew that they would not walk in uprightness or strive in righteousness. And we did according to his words, all malignant evil ones we bound in one place of condemnation and the tenth part of them we left that they might be subject before Satan on earth. And we explained to Noah all the medicines of their diseases, together with their seductions, how he might heal them with herbs of the earth. And Noah wrote down all these things in a book, as we instructed him concerning every kind of medicine. Thus the evil spirits were precluded from hurting the sons of Noah. And he gave all that he had written to Shem, his eldest son, for he loved him exceedingly above all of his sons." Now, people often ask, and I saw this in commentary, why does God, when God's talking to um, Moses on Mount Sinai and telling him this story, why does he always refer to himself as we, we did this, we did this, we, we did this? Well, if you remember from the beginning of Book of, of Jubilees, when Moses goes onto the mountain, there are also angels present with God as, as he's talking to Noah. It's not just God and Noah, but some of his angels are also with him explaining the story to Noah as well. And you know, the angels, the archangels especially, are like God's, I mean, Jesus is God's right-hand man. But when I say right-hand man, I think you guys kind of know what I mean. They're, they're kind of in the army of God and they serve him and they work with him. And, and it makes sense that they would also be there helping to explain this story to Moses. So we move on now to verse 15. And Noah slept with his fathers, and he was buried on Mount Labar in the land of Arat. 950 years he completed his life, 19 jubilees in two weeks in five years. Could you imagine living 950 years? Wow, that, I mean, wow. And in his life on earth, he exalted the children of men, save Enoch, because of his righteousness, wherein he was perfect. For Enoch's office was ordained for a testimony to the generations of the world, so that he should recount all the deeds of generations unto generations till the day of judgment. So moving on to verse 18, we're going to get into the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues. So when man really starts to drift apart and we start speaking different languages. Most Christians already know this story, um, and it's nice that this story is also in the book of Jubilees. So we're coming into verse 18. And in the three and thirtieth Jubilee, in the first year, in the second week, Peleg took himself a wife whose name was Lona, the daughter of Sinar, and she bare him a son in the fourth year of this week, and she called him Reu. For he said, Behold, the children of men have become evil through the wicked purpose of building for themselves a city and a tower in the land of Sinar. So again, this is now um, Babylon. This is where the tower of Babel is Sinar. They departed from the land of Arat eastward to Sinar, for in his days they built the city and the tower, saying, Go to, let us ascend thereby into heaven. And they began to build, and in the fourth week they made a brick with fire and brick served them for stone and the clay with which they cemented them together with asphalt which cometh out of the sea and out of the fountains of the water in the land. And they built it. Forty and three years were they building it. It breadeth with two hundred three bricks and the height of a brick was the third of one. Its height amounted to five thousand four hundred thirty three cubics and two palms and the extent of one wall was thirteen stades and the other was thirty stades. And the Lord our God said unto us, Behold, they are one people, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be withholden from them. Go to, let us go down and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech, that they may disperse into cities and nations, and one purpose will no longer abide with them till the day of judgment. 
And the Lord descended, and we descended with him to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And he confound their language, and they no longer understood one another's speech, and they ceased then to build the city and the tower. For this reason, the whole land of Sinar is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound all the language of the children of men, and from thence they were dispersed into their cities, each according to his language and his nation. And the Lord sent a mighty wind against the tower and overthrew it upon the earth. And behold, it was Ashur and Babylon in the land of Sinar, and they called it the name Overthrow. In the fourth and thirteenth jubilee, they were dispersed from the land of Sinar. We move into verse 28. This is now titled, The children of Noah entered their districts. Canaan seizes Palestine wrongfully, and Madia receives media. So this is going to get into, again, some stuff we've already talked about on the Dark Outpost, some deep dives we did into the Canaanites. So now, again, we're kind of going over stuff we already studied, which is really cool because when we studied the Canaanites on the Dark Outpost and did that deep dive, it wasn't really for biblical purposes. It was just for us to understand the elite people who rule our world today. So once more, if you have not seen that episode, I don't have it on my channel because of censorship issues. But if you go again to the Dark Outpost TV, if you're a member, if you look through the library, you should find that episode. So verse 28, and Ham and his sons went into the land which he was to occupy, which he acquired as his portion in the land of the south. So again, Ham is Africa. And Canaan saw the land of Lebanon to the river of Egypt, that it was very good. And he went not to the land of his inheritance to the west, that is to the sea. And he dwelt in the land of Lebanon, eastward and westward from the border of Jordan, from the border of the sea. And Ham, his father, and Cush, Mizraim, his brother, said unto him, Thou hast settled in a land which is not thine, and which did not fall to us by lot. Do not do so, for if thou dost so, thou and thy sons will fall in the land and be accursed through sedition. For by sedition ye have settled, and by sedition thy children will fall, and thou shalt be rooted out forever. Dwell not in the dwellings of Sham. For to Sham and to his sons did it not come by their lot. Remember, Sham, Noah's favorite son, has the Middle East, India, and China. Cursed art thou, and cursed thou shalt beyond all the sons of Noah by the cursed, by which we bound ourselves by an oath in the presence of the holy judge, in the presence of Noah and our father. So Canaan, again, is the son of Ham, who is the son of Noah. Canaan also might be um, through a relationship that Ham had with Noah's wife, his mother, again. So this is three generations now from Noah, Noah, Ham, and now Canaan. Verse 33, but he did not hearken unto them, and he dwelt in the land of Lebanon from Hamath to the entering of Egypt, and he and his sons until this day. And for this reason, this land is named Canaan. And Jepheth and his sons went towards the sea and dwelt in the land of their portion. And Madia saw the land of the sea, and it did not please him. And he begged a portion from Elan and Ashur and Aprashad, his wife's brother. And he dwelt in the land of Media near to his wife's brother until this day. And he called his dwelling place, the dwelling place of his son Media, after the name of their father, Madiah. And that ends chapter 10. That's where we're going to end it today. Next week, we'll start with chapter 11. Once again, I would love to hear your opinions down in the comment section below. Um, I know in the beginning of this video, I talked about people being kind to each other. And for the most part, everybody is very, very kind to each other. So um, I do appreciate that. Um, I always like to know your thoughts on this book. Very interesting, isn't it? I think next, after we finish the book of Jubilee, which will still be for a while because we've got about 50 chapters to cover in Jubilee, we might jump into the book of Enoch. I know I had planned originally to go back to some of the New Testament Sethian theology after Jubilee, but I'm starting to feel like it might be better if we go into Enoch next and then return after Enoch to the Sethian theology. Again, just to get a better understanding of our full creation story, since a lot of these stories have been omitted from our canonized Bible and from our history entirely. If you did join us on the Dark Outpost, you know we did talk a lot about the Epic of Gilgamesh and the flood story in Gilgamesh. 
Um, I'm not gonna really get into that here on this recording, but um, that's also something interesting to look into when it comes to giants and a flood that's not just biblical, but in another source as well. With that being said, I thank you guys so much for sitting through this reading. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. Uh, thank you to Josh McKay for doing our opening song. I had Somebody made a comment about the song and that we use in these videos. Um, when I first opened the, my YouTube channel, it was a requirement from YouTube that you have an opening and closing song. If you notice, a lot of channels have opening and closing songs. And my boyfriend's best friend actually wrote this song. Uh, Josh McKay is, is in a band. He was a part of the band Deer Hunter for a long time. Um, he is a huge talent. And so when I was trying to figure out what theme song I wanted, since I had to have it for YouTube, I went through a lot of different like free songs and I just decided that I would rather have, uh, if Josh had something, I would rather put his work on my, on my channel since he's a friend and he's really talented. And even though this channel, we cover some like heavy topics sometimes, I always want to leave it on a light note because we are moving into a truly wonderful time on our timeline. At least I believe that. And so I liked this song because it was upbeat. Um, I'm also a huge music lover as well. I'm a huge rock and roll fan, which is sad because I know a lot of the rock, rock and roll artists are, are dirty. Um, but, you know, just a way to also support Josh in, in his music quest. It's hard to be a musician. So for the people who are the person who made a comment about that, that, again, it was a requirement from YouTube and something I will con continue to do because I really like being able to um, help people out and um, get, and Josh is super talented, get his music out there. So again, if you like the song, there is a link down in the description box below. You can purchase the whole song um, from Josh. And hopefully one day soon when everything calms down, I'll be able to get Josh on the channel and interview him. He's got some cool stories about being in the music industry and all the experiences that he has had touring. So hopefully once everything calms down, um, I can get him on the channel and interview him for you guys. So anyway, thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys. And I hope that you all have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.